I guess we can agree on we all like Python, right? Python is great at doing many things. Well, in some things, it's not, well, it is still great, but there are some, some little challenges uh, to, to be able to do those things. And one of those things is um, parallel processing, in my opinion. Um, but what is parallel processing anyway? What does it mean to be able to do things at the same time? Um, maybe a real-life real life example can help us to understand that a little bit better. So imagine uh, you work in a garage and you fix cars, right? You have a pile of cars coming in one by one and you work on them, you repair them sequentially. And for you, fixing one car takes about three hours. If you fix three cars, that means that is nine hours. But you have some customers that they want to get their car back sooner than that. And you think, hey, I have two other friends, and those two friends can actually help me to get, this, get things done faster. But how fast can it get? Can this group all together uh, fix three cars in three hours instead of nine? Well, let's have a look. As I said, you have all the cars, so in order to let your other friends to start working on those cars, first you need to take one car and took it to one of your friends and come back, and then you take another car and take it to other friend and come back. Let's say those takes about 15 minutes each, so you already lost half an hour just doing this operation. Then you start working on the third car yourself, that's about three hours when this is all done. Obviously, you need to collect all those back. So overall, it will definitely take more than three hours. Well, how much more it will take? Well, it depends. First of all, where are those other friends? Like, they can be in different sections of the city, then sending those cars back and forth will take a lot of time. Uh, or they can be in close proximity, then transferring cars in between could be an easy thing. They can even be working in the same garage, which kind of sounds nice because then they will all have access to those cars, but then it will also require a lot of organization to um, orchestrate this in harmony because maybe they will try to reach out for the same tool and they will have a race condition while doing that. I think you'll see where, where the problems are coming from. And I think we have similar situations in the world of Python these days. Well, where writing code that runs uh, at the same time is not trivial. So my name is Samet Yaslan, and today I'll talk about how CPython is evolving uh, to support more parallel processing and how this can help you to get more CPU power out of your Python code. So a little bit about me first. Um, my name is Samet. You can find me in uh, LinkedIn or GitHub. I've been working in a company called Optiver and living in Amsterdam for the last 10 years. I'd like to advocate for clean, simple, and well-tested code. This is something I really enjoy. Also, I've been chairing a Python standards committee at Optiver, um, and the, the purpose of this committee is to standardize Python code bases in the company and also make best practices well known to everyone. Also something I recently started doing, so I've been using Python for more than 10 years now, I think. And recently I started also contributing to the CPython project because one day I thought, well, I used this thing for 10 years. I think I kind of feel like I need to give back something. And I started just looking around, finding tasks that are suitable for my, like the amount of time I have, also for my skill set. So started doing a few and I really enjoy doing it. Oh, also a little bit about the company I'm working for. Um, so I work in Optiver. Optiver is a trading company with a high focus on cutting edge technology. Um, we do a specific type of trading called market making. Um, we use our own capital and we have 2000 employees around the world. Um, if, you want to more, if you want to know more about what we do or how we use Python to do what we do, just find me after the talk. I'll be happy to have a chat about that. So here's today's agenda. 
Like, mainly, I want to talk about three things. First of all, the current limitations for parallel processing. Then what are the upcoming changes, those, those evolutions that I, I mentioned? And finally, some benchmark results. Um, so the current limitations of Python, I guess many of us already know this, the infamous Gil. I think that's a very unfortunate name because I think Gil really helps us right now for with certain things. So what does Gil do, first of all? So Gil is a global lock in the Python interpreter and it only allows one Python bytecode to execute at a time. Right? And it does this for a specific reason. It does this because we need to, like Python needs to protect, CPython specifically, needs to protect its internal state. Um, what does that mean? I think uh, maybe a major example is reference counting. So Python, CPython is using reference counting for memory management. And to be able to do that, all Python objects, they have a reference count, and whenever they have a, a new reference, then this reference count either got incremented or when the, the reference goes away, then the reference count decremented. Right, simple. The problem starts when Python starts doing this on multiple threads because then there's a risk of two threads accessing the reference code and changing it at the same time, which is very dangerous, hence it needs to be protected. And GIL is basically a way of facilitating this production in a way uh, without impacting the single-threaded performance of CPython too much. I think it's, it's a great thing, it really helps, but unfortunately, it causes some problems, like it doesn't allow threads to scale on multiple cores. So currently, how do we run Python in parallel? How do we scale it on multiple cores? Um, the well-known, commonly used uh, thing is multiprocessing. There's a support in the standard library, it scales well on multiple cores, but unfortunately, those workers, those garages, are far away from each other. They are in the different parts of the city. Hence, communicating between those are expensive. So what can we do? Luckily, there are some upcoming alternatives. Um, I like to group them in two categories. Mainly, one of them is free threading, aka no gill, is a, a proposal to get rid of gill, basically. Um, the second category I'd like to talk about is something called parallel sub-interpreters. So let's go into the first one, free threading change. So, um, as I said, GIL is really helping with protecting CPython's internal state. And this new proposal basically is suggesting a way of doing the same thing, but without the GIL, and also without impacting the single-threaded performance of CPython too much. Well, obviously, it will get impacted, but I think it seems like it's at, at an acceptable state, but we'll see. Um, the second thing that this change is causing is sort of an impactful and invasive change to the C API of CPython. And what does that mean? The C API is the thing you need to use if you have C extensions. Say you have a library that communicates to Python or say C, right? You, you want to execute some C code while doing Python, then this is the API you need. One common example is, for example, NumPy. So imagine that there is a new C Python release where there is a big, big change on the C API, and suddenly all that C extensions will have trouble because they need to adapt to this, which, which happens all the time. But if the, if the change is too big, then it will cause um, quite a lot of issues for, for the maintainers of extensions, uh, which is something, uh, well, that would be nice. Uh, and this proposal is doing a really smart thing, I think, by proposing an iterative plan. Hence the, the actual name of, of the PEP, making the GIL optional. So what does that mean? This proposal is implementing a, a new compile time flag where optionally you can compile 
a CPython binary without the gale. So the standard CPython will still have the gale, it will keep working the way it used to work, you know, the, the, the Python you installed to your computer will just work, as usual with, C, with gil, but there is an option to disable it at compile time. And this really helps because this gives the community to start experimenting with this. So if you, for example, have a library that integrates with uh, the C API, or if you own a C Python application that is multi-threaded and you want to see how it behaves with the new Python, I really suggest you go and check this new Python. Right. Um, you can test it, you can experiment with it, and most importantly, you can give feedback to the people who are working on this, because they need this feedback to be able to detect uh, potential issues early on. And eventually, this will help out to all of us for these attempts to succeed. So the first iteration in October this year, uh, Python 3.13 will be released. Well, GIL will be an optional thing. By default, it will still be on, but you have a chance to compile it out. And the community starts adapting. Well, you may ask, okay, but I'm just a Python application developer. I don't compile Python at all. And this seems like an experimental thing. When do I get to use it in production? Well, we'll see. Like that this is a long plan, but it will be quite soon. So what else can you do? Well, there's another change that's happening these days, and that is um, about having something called sub-interpreters and running them in parallel. Interesting thing is, that I recently learned, is sub-interpreters is a thing that has been in Python for quite a long time. But it wasn't widely used. And why is that? In my opinion, there are two reasons. First one is there is a high bar for spinning up a new sub-interpreter in the same process because you need to use the C API of Python. Like you cannot write Python code to run a new sub-interpreter, which is a difficult thing. Um, the second thing is up until Python 3.11, even if you manage to spin up and run new sub-interpreters, there was still one gil. So within the same process, you may have multiple sub-interpreters, but the gil will still not allow them to run at the same time. Well, luckily, that has changed. In Python 3.12, um, the global interpreter lock became sort of a local interpreter lock, because now every interpreter is getting its own gil which then allows those sub-interpreters to scale on multiple cores. Well, the problem is, it is still not easy to spin them up, because you need to write a lot of C code for that, which is also changing. In the next version of Python, there will be some limited support for writing Python code to be able to create new sub-interpreters and also run them on multiple cores. So to wrap it up, Parallel sub-interpreters, it's a less innovative change, so likely to be available a lot sooner than free threading. And it's mostly cheaper than multiple processing because you do less, right? They deal in the same process. And it's also creating a nice isolation because even though some of those sub-interpreters in the same process, they are still nicely isolated from each other. And that is kind of forcing the developers to do the right things. Well, of course, there's a cost. They are most, more expensive than multi-threading because in the end, they are still isolated. You need to make an effort to communicate between them. Okay, but then which one is better? What are we going to use? Well, my answer to that is it really depends. Um, for example, if you have a task that takes X amount of time, so if you do this task 10 times sequentially, well, it's obvious you will spend 10x amount of time. And for example, if you do this and distribute those 10 tasks to 10 different threads in Python now with the gil, 
it will take more than 10x and it will not parallelize at all. That's because all those threads also have an overhead for starting and stopping them. So that doesn't make much sense. And of course, I'm talking about purely Python code here. Um, if you have a code that does file I.O. or other things, sometimes it still does make sense to, to use multi-threading with Gil. But that's, that's a different story. If you go and use the no-gil C Python and do the same thing, well, as expected, this task will take less than 10x, actually just a little bit more than x because it is running on multiple cores. So if your goal is to optimize for wall clock time, yeah, using those, one of those options for parallelizing makes sense. However, if your goal is to optimize for CPU costs, like to spend less energy, less CPU power, it doesn't matter what you use. Even if you use a no guild thread, you will still be burning more CPU power than doing it sequentially. So if you can, if it works for you, writing sequential code is beautiful because it's just the simplest thing you can do. It's easier to understand the code. You will have less problems. But obviously, that's not always the case. And in those cases, what are we going to use to be able to run Python code on multiple cores? Um, so I did these benchmarks. I will share the code later on on my GitHub page. Um, I took the, the latest, one of the latest tags of the 313 branch and compiled it with disabling gil, and I looked at two things mainly. The first one is how much do we see, spend, how much CPU do we spend for starting and stopping these workers? And the second thing is then how do they communicate with each other? So the first one, starting and stopping costs. So if you go back to our garage example, this is basically the amount of time you spend for turning the lights on in your garage. Like you came in, you have a cup of coffee, sort out your tools, like all the things you need to do before you can actually start working on the first car. And if you compare this, um, you will see that for multiprocessing, at least on the computer that I was using, was taking more than uh, 70 milliseconds to start and stop one process. And sub-interpreters are eight times faster than that. And if you look at no guilt threads, that is 40 times faster. One interesting detail here, when I say multiprocessing, I mean spawning a new process, which basically means starting a brand new process from scratch. So little asterisk, there is also a concept called forking a new process, and if you do multiprocessing, I suggest you check that out. Um, on POSIX systems like Linux, for example, you can actually fork a new process, which is a lot faster than multiprocessing, even a little bit faster than subinterpreters. But of course, there's a, there's a disadvantage of it because forking actually copies your process with all these internals, with all the variables and everything as it is. And as you can imagine, if you have a file pointer or a socket I.O., then things can go wrong. So be careful. OK, um, starting stopping time is nice. And yeah, we see that it takes, what, 70 milliseconds for processes? Then that was the worst case scenario. Well, you may have situations where this matters. But in most of the cases, actually, you don't start and stop a process that much, like a worker, sorry. Yeah, a process. Um, what do you normally do, like going back to the garage example, you open up your garage in the morning, then you work all day. You get an input of cars that they come in and you fix them one by one, but it doesn't matter how long it takes as long as it's small enough. So if your processes are starting, like if, if the start-stop costs of your processes are around 70 milliseconds, and if your whole task is about 10 hours, who cares if you are spending 10 milliseconds, right? Well, I think so. And then in those cases, what does matter? I think what matters is inter-worker communication. So to say, how long does it take to send a car from one garage to the other? 
So to have a closer look at that, I did another test, and I measured the round trip time for sending one message of one byte between those workers. Right? So I have two processes. I'm sending a, a message from one process to another and getting it back and measure the time in between. And I repeat that for sub-interpreters and also no guilt threats. So as you can see, um, sub-interpreters are able to work two times faster than multi-processing. So they are able to send messages two times faster between each other. And if you look at no guilt threats, that is, again, 40 times faster. And I also look at what happens when I start increasing the message size. And this is what I see. It gets worse. I, especially for multiprocessing, it gets worse faster. And that's because multiprocessing has to do a lot more to be able to package all those messages, all those objects into something streamable and sending to the other process. And sub-interpreters are also doing something similar, but they are doing a little bit less, so it gets worse, but slower. Well, maybe you notice no guilt threads are also part of this graph, but they are not very visible, so let's zoom in on that a little bit. This is how it looks. It is quite stable, because they are not actually sending anything, they are just passing the pointer, passing the references, so it works quite fast. So to wrap it up, before you go, I'd like you to remember a couple things. First of all, sequential code is beautiful. If that solves your problems, just stick to that. Simple. Well, if it doesn't, and you really need to run Python code at the same time on multiple cores, keep an eye on the upcoming changes. They can help you. Well, and you can also help those people working on those changes by testing them with your C extensions with your Python applications and give them feedback. And sub-interpreters, they seem like they, will, they are happening a lot sooner and are also offering a nice speed up. Um, and disabling the GIL, well, maybe it will happen sometime later, but it is opening up for greater enhancements. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? We have microphones for people who want to ask questions. You can even line up in parallel. Ha -ha. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I saw the first thread here. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, this multiprocessing module supports shared memory. Did you experiment with the shared memory if this changes things? Very good question. That's the next thing I want to do. I want to check how much memory they are using. Indeed, no, I haven't looked at that yet. No. No, I mean shared memory. So the, there's a shared memory module for multiprocessing. So you, have, you, you don't have to serialize the memory. You, you can access the same memory from different processes. Right. Um, so what I use for, for these benchmarks, I just use the standard um, queues that are available in those modules. So for multiprocessing, that is multiprocessing queue. And there's a similar thing for sub-interpreters. So I haven't used anything more complex. I agree. If we start looking deeper and start um, checking out what else can be done. This, these numbers can be improved, but I just focused on the standard things that are available. Uh, hello, thank you for your interesting presentation, first of all. Uh, how safe uh, is NoGeo? Because it's first, in the first order is for protection, so how uh, safe is to disable Jill and uh, this no geo flag in parallel processing? Um, well, good question. I think it's kind of a little bit above my pay grade, but I can tell you what I know. Um, I look at the code and I look at the extensive testing that is happening for, for multi threading. I, I even picked up a little task and implemented the, the thread sanitizer or enable it. So you can say there's a, a lot of extensive testing, but obviously this is still an experimental thing. And the ask to the Python community is to start using it, start testing it, so we, like everybody, can learn about what needs to be done, what else needs to be done. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. 
Um, does subinterpreters share memory or do they also do some kind of uh, streaming? Or why is it faster but not as fast as the GIL, uh, as the no -gil, sorry? Um, there, is an, there is an option in subinterpreters uh, and for certain uh, data types, they can share uh, those objects more effectively. I think they don't require pickling, but they just make a copy of the object somehow. But it's only possible for certain types, and I kind of use one of those types, obviously. But most common types are supported. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, I'd like to ask you if you can give one or two examples of how we can experiment with Node.js. Sure. Um, it's actually very simple. You go to GitHub and download, uh, just clone the, the CPython project and uh, compile it with this, this flag, disable gil, and it just happens. Okay, thanks for that. And um, yeah, can you recommend any examples also in our daily work where we can, uh, yeah, experiment with Python with disabled gil? I mean, for, for what type of, of work, for example? Um, for example, if you have a Python project that you want to run on multiple cores, like a multi-threaded Python project, um, then you can do that. Okay. Like you will see that it just can run on multiple cores. It can run Python code on multiple cores. So I can answer a previous question. Uh, someone asked uh, how safe was it to use NoGil uh, with existing Python code bases? Uh, we have some experience with this because there are two Python implementations that have never had a GIL, Jython running on the JVM and Iron Python running on uh, Microsoft CLR. Uh, those don't have GILs and Python code bases tend to just kind of be okay. Uh, fundamentally, the built-in objects all have to be atomic. So like adding something or examining uh, a dict uh, appending to a list, those have to be atomic operations and those are in those implementations as well as in Python no GIL. And beyond that, obviously you want, uh, you're gonna look at things and say, okay, we need some locks here and that sort of thing. But even without like locks, I believe that the, the experience was like even large projects like Django would run okay with multiple threads simultaneously under Jython and Iron Python. So I think the future looks okay for no gil Python and existing code bases. I hope so too. Any other questions? All right, let's all thank Summit for a fantastic talk. And we'll be back in five.